I would argue that if you are drawing up construction documents, your goal is to communicate intent so that it gets you what you want. Aesthetically, structurally, durability in terms of life expectancy, especially if you're doing streetscape public works. One of the things that you want in this process is efficient transfers of information. It might be nice if the other persons, the other players can read and can understand what it is you put into a contract drawing or a spec with minimal effort. In, or, in going from most obvious to least obvious, I'm going to tell you four things that I think affect your efficiency when you are creating information that you are going to transfer to somebody else. Time, firm time to design. How much does it cost you personally and or the firm to, do, to draw something? The more you draw it, the more it costs. Think about the cost and the benefits that you or anybody else get from any word or any line. If you're going to draw a line, you're going to throw in a word, what value is it to anybody? You know it's a cost. You've got to say, what am I doing with this? Why am I doing it? Ask not what details you can draw, but ask what those details can do for you. The second one is your time and administration, construction administration, and clearly the clearer the details, the fewer RFIs, the fewer addenda they're going to be pre-bid, the less back and forth during the whole process. Risk of disputes would be the third thing because the, nothing is better for creating a dispute than ambiguity or conflicts over anything and whether by dispute we don't just mean going to court. We mean the ridiculous amount of time that is spent in meetings, in a trailer, with the general contractor, may or may not be referred, you know, I mean, even if somebody asks for an extra and it's turned down. And lastly, is the reputation of the firm. That would be the fourth issue, efficiency. Do your documents get you a better or worse reputation with owners, with contractors, okay? There's a lot of factors on all this, but what, I'm, what I would say to you all there's some, I'm trying to connect dots, there's some connection here among drawings, project outcomes, reputation. Be consistent, which means that if you're going to say it more than once, make sure you're really saying the same thing twice. And ask yourself also, what is the point of repeating? I hold, a contractor's feet are held to the fire. If I said it once, it counts. If I say it twice, I've cre and, it, and it's different, it's a conflict. So if I can hold them to, they owe it to me because it's somewhere in the damn spec. If you don't understand what you're drawing, if you don't understand something, don't show it. Differentiate in your mind between performance and prescription. Do something or here's what I want you, you to do. It's prescription, performance is here's what I want it to do. This is true for your details. It's true for spec written specifications. Lastly, always show or note what is important to you. If it's a key appearance issue, it's a performance issue, structural load transfers, if it's important, tell somebody that it's important and you're more likely to get what you want. So we're gonna look at a bunch of teeny tiny details. One word in one detail on a whole project. I am not so obsessive that I actually care about each of those words. I pick them out because they think they illuminate the bigger picture, the bigger issues, okay? This is the architectural, the first architectural st section. Here's what's wonderful about this one. Here's an arrow that says it's a decorative cast stone veneer. Oh, here's an arrow that says it's a precast concrete panel at the garage door head. That obviously this illustrates the problem of duplication and consistency. Now we also note here, we're supposed to also see the structural drawings, which is good, it's true. Here is a detail from an architect. I'm gonna start on the lower left because this was one of the more interesting things. Note precast panel to be provided with temporary carriage bracing at four 
four inches horizontal, base member until finally installed permanent, finally installed with permanent carriage bracing. And I went and I Googled it, and you know what? The only thing, to, citations I could find were something about the undercarriage of a race car or something, <laughs> automobile. So here's one of my rules. Don't use them, don't make up your own words, okay? And don't borrow them, you're a landscape architect, don't borrow from something else. If you don't know what other people call it, learn it or say minimal things about it. Let's go to the next slide and let us remember that we've already been told back before, see the structural drawings. The structural drawings, right, brick support. This is supporting the brick. Well, that was important to us because without going through every drawing, when I, and I only had a couple sheets when I was pricing it, this actually helped me because it says the loads include a lot of brick, okay? Which is different than if it, you got to know what things are in my business. You got to know what they're doing, but I think it's interesting. Here's another language. It's a precast brick support. This is a one sheet shop drawing. You're seeing the whole thing. We give them an elevation. We, I decided I'd rather make this in three pieces. And since the contract drawing was ambiguous, I could have just put false joints in there. They didn't tell me. I said, if I were installing it, I'd want it as one piece. I might want it as one piece. It's part of what goes on in this business. Everybody's shifting costs and risks. This is a note that says EOR. That's engineer of record. While we do not need stiffeners, you may need them for the beam. So we're asking them a question, okay? Because it was, right, it was there. In the contract, we had, there were stiffeners. They're not mine, they're on the beam by somebody else. I looked at the steel guy's shop drawings. Um, and we, so we asked them, my engineer, who is very cautious and is a specialist in precast, which is, you know, you start, you get, start getting real narrow, it's like certain, like be like an arborist who only works with certain trees or something. He says, we note to the engineer of record that he should design the beam flange for bending due to our gravity connection. That's ours up here. And the rest of the, and design it for torsion, any bending we put on it, okay? We're communicating with him over liability issues here. Because if this thing twists, I don't want it to be my problem. Let's go to the next one. Okay, uh, this is just the context. We'll blow them up in the next one. So this is a big, tall column that there are going to be. This is the one, maybe there's 14, 16, or 18 of them that make a very nice um, sort of colonnade with a, um, with a trellis up here, okay? And we're going to look at each one of these in the next slide. So I just wanted to give you the context. So they're telling me it's solid which is nice, I can tell that from some of the other details, but then there's no ambiguity because sometimes we do columns as column covers with some steel inside, or sometimes we want to make it partly hollow just for our own purposes because it structurally doesn't need to be solid. They're telling me it's solid, great, I like that. They're telling me it's a light sandblast, light buff color, boy, I know a lot. Submit a color sample for approval, there's no ambiguity, there's clear dimensions here, uh, you know, color and finish, I'm good to go. Very nice. Next slide. So far up at the top here, Goldilocks is still happy, the porridge is wonderful. So it's stainless, it's a threaded sleeve, which is, by the way, not a word I would ever use, but that's okay, I know what it means. And I gotta coordinate it with the bracket fabricator, because there's gonna be a bracket, there's a whole structural system, there's a bracket, there's wood trellis, it's gotta deal uplift, it's gotta deal this, that, etc. Okay, great. So the material up here is clear, the function of what that's doing is clear. If they don't just prescribe it and say, put an insert in here, then I have to guess what it's for. It's fine. Nothing has been faked or guessed. It's, nothing's going to confuse me. When I keep looking at this thing, I'm looking at the rebar, and it's, it's called out four number sixes, blah, blah, here, that get welded to the bolt plate. But I'm starting to wonder all of a sudden. And when I see here 16, 16 by bracket, 
That's not a one, folks. That's a bracket. Oh, I've blown it up here. I think you can see it. That's an indication of something that was lifted to be dimensioned later by others or something. I say, well, now, if this person is telling me that the thickness here is unknown, maybe I can't trust them for the rebar. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Same bracket here, bolt plate. This tells me guessing. This tells me they're guessing. Let's keep going here. What do we got next? This is the same one. This is my final conclusion. They had another chance in this detail. Maybe it was a typo. They forgot to tell me how thick the plate is. Why do they bother to tell me about rebar? Why do they bother to, <clears throat> why don't they just not put any dimensions and just say anchor bolt, just, you know, that's it. Let me size it. Let me do everything. I got to do it anyway. I'll take responsibility. And it's not just me. It's every trade. Unless this, you think the trade doesn't take responsibility, then you should. Or you should only open it to people who know what they're doing. This is a fountain, and I believe it's an a new fountain in an existing library. So here's the plan for it. Let's go to the next one. That's your context. Here's a water feature. It's in front of a library. OK. I don't know much about stone, but I'm going to tell you that 18 inches and a 9 inch embedment in stone might be perfect. But when I see that 9 inches of a half inch round stainless steel pin going into the concrete in the middle of a fountain, I say, is the landscaper's bobcat going to hit this stone and do we have to make sure it doesn't move then? Because he can hit it at 20 miles an hour before it's going to do anything to that rod. I, can tell, I don't know about stone. I know in concrete this half, it's overkill. That's all. It's not a big deal. Remember, I'm a microcosmist, folks. I don't really care about that, but I do say, why do it? OK, so now we're here. Interesting to me, here, we don't know how long big it is. They don't, there's no dimension. Sort of a little bit inconsistent here. I also notice here, it says there's an existing two foot, wide, two foot dimension from here to here. And it's going to remain. Usually, every architect says verify everything in field because we're not taking responsibility for anything. Here, there's no VIF. So most, most precasters would say this is two foot. They'd make the piece. And if it doesn't fit, there's a big fight. Then, then you get to put in two hours of construction administration time instead of 20 seconds to say VIF and existing dimension. And I guarantee you that if it's a problem, it's going to take you two hours because it's going to go back and forth because it's going to be big money because you're not going to detect the problem until it's installed and you don't like the overhang. I don't know. Is there no connection needed here? What do I know? I'm not an engineer. I'm just sort of surprised. Everything else is. So when I look at it, I saw that stone seemed to me overkill. This seems to me underkill. OK, what do we got here? We got up here. We like this. No ambiguity here, piece lengths. Look at this thing. There's the whole entire plan. This seat wall consists of three pieces. That's all it is. It's a tiny little seat wall. I know what the dimensions are. I know what's happening at the corner. I don't have any argument about what kind of corner am I mitering it. There's a very clear intent. So that's great. But I've blown up this which says contractor provide a full-size mock-up section of a precast wall for owner's approval prior to installation. Huh? Full-size, yeah, what kind of mock-up? It's three pieces. I think this is the last one. This is an existing building with a trash enclosure, and I think they're putting in an, either an added or new generator enclosure out back behind an office building. So this is the architectural sheet. It's got four elevations and two sections. And this plan is only on the civil sheet. That is not repeated. And you know what? That's OK. Why bother drawing it again? OK. Uh, so well, when we look at the Goldilocks likes this plan view, because again, it tells her something about the jointing. It tells her the dimensions. It's about all she needs to know. She's happy. Here is an example of one of the elevations. It tells me the reveals match, go match the building. Okay? One of the things that this person did, they never even drew the reveal. It's full of reveals, 
and they don't, in the, in the plans, tell me what size the reveals are. And you know what? It's fine. Because even if they draw them, I don't trust them. Because if they're wrong, it's my problem. I have to make a trip out there anyway. It's fine. I, I look at this. I don't have any problem. I know everything I need to know in order to price it. Anything I don't know, I only need to know if I'm doing it. Now, here, he tells me six inches, but he also says, you're engineering it, Leo. So guess what? If it isn't six inches, you're going to verify it. And he even tells me not only that I'm doing it, but if it isn't six inches, I don't even have to talk to him because I'm going to hold the inside dimension, hold the interior dimension, move it out. And there are, believe me, situations in which it's the opposite. They never dimension the reveal that we said. Goldilocks is loving this. She's still happy. This is back, same section at that same elevation. No question, I got a new piece, uh, matching. Now you can't, can you zoom in on this? This is dark line, folks. This is the opposite of the first one you saw. Here, he's showing you something and pointing to it, says that you need a connection. When you go back, he said, you're going to need a new connection. And he's pointing to it to tell me it's there. I know you're going to need it, and I want it to be hidden. And if you can't do that, put it on the generator side. This almost doesn't need a shop drawing. This guy, this person has communicated enough. I can just take it and do it, and they're not going to be surprised. I talked in the beginning about, we could, about the difficulties of communication because we had some in terms of expectation about the intent of this between King and I. What was the intent in trying to communicate it to you guys? And at the extent you didn't get what you thought you were going to get, that just is an illustration of how hard it is to communicate intent. But that's what you're in the business of doing. So, but instead of calling this talk as being about how do you communicate intent, it's about asking you to think a little more about what your intent is. Okay? That's ultimately the summary. The shortest summary of everything I said is when you're clear on in your own intent, you can more effectively communicate it to all the people who have to consume your drawings. That's it, folks. That's all I got to say. Mm -hmm.